Good morning. Good to see you this morning. Glad you could be here and excited to be in the Lord's house this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, Brother Pat, would you mind leading us in prayer? Amen. You may be seated. The crowd pressed in to see this man who stood condemned to die. A man they once proclaimed as king, they now would crucify. They laid a cross upon his back and pushed him up the road. The path would lead to Calvary. He fell beneath the load. And as I watched, I understood the burden that he bore was more than just a heavy tree, the weight was so much more the weight of the cross was the weight of my sin not the weight of the tree that was carried by him my guilt and disgrace Jesus bore in my place on Calvary's road, neath the weight of the cross. His face was scarred, his body bruised, his head was crowned with thorns. The crowd now jeered and cursed his name, the object of their scorn. He never spoke a word to them, the silent Lamb of God. This man of sorrow bore the cross he chose to carry on. But somehow in his eyes I saw a love beyond the pain. As if he knew his sacrifice and loss would be my gain. The weight of the cross was the weight of my sin, not the weight of the tree that was carried by him. My guilt and disgrace, Jesus bore in my place on Calvary's road, on Calvary's road, on Calvary's road, neath the weight of the cross. the Prince of Glory died.
And let's stand together, page 603, in the sweet by and by, as we look at that promise of heaven. And that promise of heaven is found in what Christ has done for us. But what a great place this is. John 14, 2 and 3 says, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may be also. What a great promise that is. Let's sing together, page 603, in the sweet. There's a land that is fair and and by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet by and by we shall meet. We'll sing that third in just a moment. That the choir is going to come down as the instruments play. Greet one another. We'll sing that third in just a minute. We'll sing on that third together to our bountiful Father above. To our bountiful Father above, we will offer a tribute of praise for the glorious gift of His love and the blessings that hallow our days in the sweet. Amen. Men, would you please come forward? We'll take this morning's tithes and offerings. And while they're coming, I've had a few prayer requests given to me. Uh, of course, remember Bob, if you would, in prayer, Bob Howard. And uh, just physically, that Lord would give him strength and keep him encouraged. And then uh, the Howard family as well, Jonathan and Randy, uh, they have COVID right now, so pray for them. And then uh, Juanita asked for prayer for her brother-in-law, and uh, his name is, I can't read my own handwriting, Juanita. Chuck Pollock, and so pray for him if you would, uh, as he's recovering, that the Lord will give him strength as well, all right? Yes, Stephanie. Okay. Okay, well, let's pray for the family then. All right, anyone else before we go to the Lord in prayer? Yes, Pam. Okay. Okay, pray for the Lord and family. They have a, a son with COVID. So let's pray for them as well. Well, Pastor Stan, would you mind leading us in prayer?
again. You may be seated. Well, how many are going with us to Branson tomorrow morning? Got a good group of us going, and our senior saints, we've been planning this really all year, and uh, gearing up for it, and tomorrow is the day. So just a reminder, uh, we're going to head out tomorrow at 7, and so if you could be here a little bit early to get everything packed up, we'll hit the road, and uh, looking forward to a good week. Bring your snacks, uh, but not too much luggage, right, Teresa? Not too much luggage. we got to fit it in the bus, uh, but that'll be, a, that'll be a fun trip. Looking forward to that this week. And then three weeks from today is our retirement weekend and uh, just uh, reminded you on that we're going to have a nine o'clock Sunday school that week and brother Jeff Estes will be with us and he's going to take that time to kind of update us on his ministry out in Idaho and if you remember we we're kind of the sending church for Jeff when he planted that church and to see what God's been doing will be an exciting thing to hear and then we'll have the uh, a brunch in between and then a 10 30 service and uh, that'll be a good time of celebration and just praising the Lord for all he's done over the last uh, 41 years. And so, uh, reminder, that Sunday is our retirement service, uh, and that Friday we're going to have a celebration banquet. And uh, if you could RSVP for that, uh, let Karis know or text us or email us, and that'll just help us get a head count for food and for seating. Um, and that is free. I know some people have asked that. Uh, so if you have a friend that's wondering that, let them know it's free. Everybody's welcome to come, uh, but a head count would help us a lot, all right? And then first through sixth grade have an activity coming up on uh, October 29th, and they are going to the Whitetail Tree Farm. They'll meet out there at 10 o'clock, and it will be done at noon. It's $6.50 uh, per person, and that includes a corn maze, donuts, pumpkins, and more. So if you have any questions, uh, see Tyler or Chris, and they can help you with that, uh, but appreciate them putting that together. Then the last thing I'll mention to you this morning, you may have seen it on your way in, we have our display table out there for Operation Christmas Child. And what we do each year, we've done this, I, I forget this is our third or fourth year at this point, Amy, uh, but there's a ministry where they put together boxes uh, of Christmas presents for kids all over the world and they ship them to these kids, uh, but they also use that as a tool to share the gospel with these kids. It's been very effective. And so our goal this year is to send out 100 boxes if we can. And on the back table, we have the boxes provided. You're welcome to take those. And there's a list that kind of shows you what to fill them up with, the different toys, what to put in, what not to put in. And then if we could have those in by the beginning of November, we'll get those sent out. And uh, we'll have uh, a video tonight kind of uh, helping us get our minds geared up for that. Uh, but just so you're aware of what's going on in the back and be part of that if you'd like to. All right, well, let's sing one more song and then we'll have a special. Let's stand together our final song this morning. It's page 242. We've learned it together these last two weeks. It's in his name. And I was just sitting with a young man this last week, and he actually came to Christ on Monday. And this verse really spoke to him. He said, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What a great simple verse that is. But this promise of heaven that we have is found in Christ and in his name and in his power. Let's sing together page 242. 
There is a rest in every woe. There is a refuge from the foe. There is a peace this world can know. It's in his name. There is a glow in darkest night, a dawn of hope, a guiding light. There is a help in helpless plight. It's in his name. It's in his name. His name is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. His name is Jesus, and he's ever the same. There is a calm when fear assails. There is a power all nature hails. There is a love that never sing that second verse as we sing that second kids you're dismissed to junior church as we join together on that second verse there is an all sufficient grace a welcome smile a warm embrace there is a sweet abiding place it's in his name there is a promise for each need a helping hand Seed, a tender voice to cheer and lead. It's in his name. It's in his name. His name is wonderful. Counselor, mighty God. His name is Jesus, and he's ever the same. There is a call. singing this morning. You may be seated. <laughs> you can search all of this life and never understand the storms and all the strife seem unguarded by God's hand. Raise your weary head and lift your tired eyes. Christ has conquered death and he listens when your tears before you do he's there he is here don't you fear his word will be your light his voice will be your guide his hands will give you strength with his spirit by your side. Raise your weary head and lift your tired eyes. Christ has conquered death. He will raise you to the skies. There's no cries 
Would you please turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, Ecclesiastes 4. We're doing our series through the book of Ecclesiastes. We've entitled it Made for More. And what we're really doing is we're looking at Solomon's writings. And by this point, Solomon has come more towards the end of his life. And he's looking back over his life. And, and uh, really, he's writing about his life with a tone of regret. And he had done a lot of things. He had accomplished a lot of things. And, and as he's re reflecting back, he... He says, yes, I accomplished a lot by the world's standards, but, but really, when you look at it in the big picture, I've wasted my life. And he, he's urging us to not live the way that he lived. And we can kind of take Solomon's life and reverse engineer it and, and see how we are to live, what we were made for. Well, what kind of life did God create us to live? And so week number one, we looked at we were made for God. You will not find true satisfaction. You will not try and find true purpose in life outside of God. I, uh, I, you ever have just a random memory from when you were a child and, and you forgot about it for like decades and then something happens and triggers it and jogs it loose in your mind? You ever had that happen before? I had that happen this week and uh, thought about a sweet little lady I haven't thought about in years. Uh, how many of you remember a lady by the name of Vera Shelton? Anybody remember Vera? And I remember when I was a kid, she was here at the church, and uh, she had some stuff going on at her house, so a group of guys went out to, to help fix up the house and that sort of thing. And while I was, was there, you'd have to know Vera, and if you know Vera, this would make sense. She, uh, she took all the scrap pieces of wood, I think they were putting baseboard down, that sort of thing, and just these little pieces of wood, and she took them all, and she put them in this plastic or brown paper bag, and she handed me just this random <laughs> blocks of wood, and she said, here you go, Brian, she said, this is a puzzle. Now, in my mind, a puzzle means it fits together, right? And so I took, the, I took the bag, and I emptied it out on the floor, and for the next, like, three hours, I'm trying to take all these random pieces of wood and fit them down. I, I hate puzzles to this day, man. They, they just would not fit together, you know? And uh, I, I was thinking about that. Something brought that to my mind. I thought, you know, that's, that's kind of what Solomon's saying. He's saying, for years, I tried to take all the pieces of life, and, and I thought I could just make them fit together, and I could make it happen, but, but what I found out is without God, you cannot make life make sense. Life does not work outside of God. You will not find a purpose big enough to live for outside of God. Even the pain in your life has no purpose unless you know God. And he, he said the first week, you were made for God. And then last week, we looked at how we were made for seasons. In the same way that God ordains the, the beauty and orchestrates the beauty of the different seasons, God also ordains and orchestrates the seasons of our life. And whatever season you are in today, God has allowed you to be in that season, and it has its beauty, so be content. Enjoy the blessings that God has placed in this season. 
it has its burdens, so remember to give them to God and let him be the one that carries them. And, and today is one you're going to like. Today we're going to look at you were made for rest. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 4, and let's look at verse 6. He says in verse 6, Better is a handful with quietness than both hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. Then I turned and I saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone and there is not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother. Yet is there no end of all his labor. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, for whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good. This also is vanity. Yea, it is sore travail. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And I'd like to spend a few minutes walking through this passage this morning. Lord, we thank you for the chance to worship you this morning. And I thank you for the uh, fellowship of a church family that uh, just wants to come together and, and bring praise to you. And I, I pray that you would meet with us today. Lord, we need you. Lord, I need you as we, we look at your word that uh, your spirit's the only thing that, that can make an impression on a heart through your word. And I, I pray that you would be with us, that you'd give us power. I pray as we go through this week that you would help us to, to find rest in you. I pray as we travel for our trip that you would make it a time of refreshing. And we just thank you for all you've done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Two raccoons stood on the edge of a deserted highway. They were staring, staring up at a well-lit billboard in the middle of the night. The billboard was an advertisement for an insomnia clinic. The raccoons' faces registered deep concern as they read the two questions on the billboard. Do you have dark circles under your eyes? <laughs> Are you often awake through the night? <laughs> How many of you would be honest enough to say that this morning... You're a little bit tired. Anybody a little bit tired today? How many of you, how many of you, if you're being honest, you've had a long week? You've had a long week this week. How many of you, you've just, you've had a long decade? It's been a rough decade, <laughs> this, this last one. Well, the truth is, all of us uh, need rest. All of us need a break. Me and Karis, we have a running joke that uh, when we have a busy season or a busy week, we'll look at each other and we'll say, we'll say, well, I think next week it's really supposed to start slowing down. You ever had that conversation before? It never does, you know. We have a, uh, I made a mistake. We made a mistake about two months ago now. There was a cat that came through our front yard, and uh, we made the mistake of giving that cat some food. And uh, so now uh, that cat lives there, and its four little ones live on our porch, and uh, we no longer have a front porch. And so uh, about a month ago, we were out on our front porch, and and there's these little kittens that this cat had. And, and on the porch, we put them in a little box, and the kittens couldn't get out of the box, but the mama cat could get out of the box. And so we would watch, and we'd judge this cat, because this cat would jump out of the box and sit beside the box so that the kittens couldn't bother her. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and uh, we, me and Karis were out on the porch one evening, and we were watching this, and uh, we were judging this cat for hiding from its young while we were sitting on the porch hiding from ours. <laughs> and uh, it finally hit us that, hey, we shouldn't be judging this cat so much, you know. Well, the truth is, all of us were made for times of rest. All of us need a break once in a while. And uh, one of the things God calls us to throughout Scripture is he calls us to regular, restorative rest in our lives, both physically and spiritually. Have you ever noticed with little kids that little kids, if you ask them, they are never tired. You, you've seen that before? I mean, they can, they can be up for three days straight, and you ask them, are you tired? No, I'm not tired. No, I want to keep going, right? And uh, they, the last thing in the world they want to do is lay down for a nap because they're going to miss out on life or this or that. And, and uh, you know, I, I think with kids, unless you actually command them to lay down and rest, they're just not going to do it. You with me? I, I think that we are much more like those kids than we like to admit. I think God knew that our tendency is to just go and go and go until we crash. And so that's why in his word, repetitively from the beginning to the end, God is calling us to times of rest. Maybe, maybe you've experienced that crash before, where you've just gone and gone and gone and, and until you couldn't go anymore and you've just crashed. Maybe you're experiencing that right now. And God gives very clear, and I, I would also add very compassionate commands for us to rest. Now, I want you to walk away today and realize this. Our God 
is not an oppressive God. Amen? He says that his, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. In the Old Testament, he, he told the Israelites that he was going to give them seven days in each, each week, and he wanted them to give one of those days back to him through rest and worship. If you're familiar with the Ten Commandments, you've probably heard of the word Sabbath. It's a Hebrew word with the idea of ceasing, desist, or to rest. God commanded the Jews from every Friday evening through Saturday evening that they were to take one day out of their seven-day week and give it back to him. And on that day, they were not to work, they were not to cook, they were not to travel. They were simply to enjoy God and the blessings that God had provided. And we're no longer under the law. Christ has fulfilled the law. But nonetheless, there is still a principle of the Sabbath that can be found both in the New Testament and the Old. That God has called us to have times of rest. We are called for regular, repetitive rest, both daily and weekly. And uh, some of you, some of you right now, you are, you are looking really excited. You're like, Pastor Brian, are you really going to preach that we need to sleep more? Like, like some of you are taking notes, and I've never seen you take notes before. God does call us to rest. Our God is not an oppressive God. He's not a God that tries to, to wring every last drop out of us for his benefit. He is a God of rest. And Solomon, he, he talks about how he lived his life without rest. He tried to go and to go and to go and to, to, to burn the candle on both ends. And he talks about how, how that ended up leaving him with travail and vexation of spirit. I want to give you three thoughts about the rest God has called us to. First of all, I want you to see that resting is restoring. We see that in verse 6. He says, better is a handful with quietness than both hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. Isn't that great imagery that, that Solomon gives there? He, he talks about how, how if we try to go lo to, through life and keep both hands full, keep our calendars so full, keep our days so full, keep our lives so full, and, and just try to cram everything into our lives that we possibly can. He says the, the end result is vexation of spirit and travail. We used to, when I was children's pastor, we used to play a game, uh, do you remember the Mad Dash we do with the little kids? And that was the big game. And the Mad Dash, the way it worked is if a, a kid won a prize, their prize was they got to play the Mad Dash. And at the front, we'd have a table, and it'd be set up with all sorts of prizes and candy bars and all that sort of thing, and two liters of pop. And, and the kids would start at the back, and they'd get 60 seconds to come grab a prize, run back, put it in their bag, and then do it again, and, and just get as much as they can in that 60 seconds, you know. And uh, a time or two, I made the mistake of not telling the kids they could only grab one prize at a time. And they would take off. And it was unbelievable. I mean, they're grabbing candy bars and two liters and little toys. And there's like, like a 50-pound kid is carrying 60 pounds worth of sugar, you know, back and forth. And uh, the parents really liked it. They, they thought that was a good game. And uh, that, that's kind of what Solomon's saying here. He's saying, I lived life with both hands full. I, I tried to, to, to max out my capacity in life, to do as much as I could, as often as I could, uh, and do as much as I can in my life. And he came to the end of his life, and he said, that wasn't how life was supposed to be lived. I tried to wring every last drop out of life, and it ended up making me sick of my soul. Does that not sound like our culture today? Does our culture not tell us that we need to be doing more and have more in our schedules, and we need to work more so that we can afford to buy more things and go more places, and our kids need to have more sports programs and and more activities, and, and, and everything we can do, we need to do more of it. And Solomon says that's not the way life was supposed to be lived. Solomon crammed his life full. You can look at chapter 2 and see what he did, the way he lived. He, clammed, he crammed his life full of pleasure and parties. He crammed it full of study and education. He crammed it full of business ventures and building projects and growing his portfolio. And at the end of it, he said, I shouldn't have done that. I should have learned to rest in God. There's a study done by H&R Block in 2019, and they said that, that today the average American has four hours and 26 minutes of free time a week. That's 38 minutes a day. And they said even with that much life being crammed into our hours, that, that the average person still leaves 14 items on their to-do list undone. Another study found that one, only 1 to 3% of Americans are getting too much sleep. 
And uh, th those are called teenagers. That's what that's called. <laughs> they say in 1879, the average person slept in 11 hours, of no uh, 11 hours of sleep each night before the invention of the light bulb. And all sorts of studies have showed us that, that the body, our body was not designed for perpetual motion. It was not designed to go constantly without rest. And yet our, our society tells us we need to do more, be more, and accomplish more with our lives. And what Solomon says is this. He says that's not how life is supposed to be lived. He says that God has showed us a better way. In fact, he, he showed us this in the very second chapter of the entire Bible. Do you remember when he did creation on the seventh day? What did God do on the seventh day of creation? He rested. Well, why did he do that? Did he rest because he was just so tuckered out from all the creation that he said, just give me a minute, fellas, I, let me catch my breath? Is that why he did it? No. The reason he rested was to set the pace for us, for us to see how we were created to live. We were not created to go seven days a week, 365 days a year. We were created for rest. I, I love the verse in Mark chapter 6, verse 31. Christ is with his disciples, and as he's with his disciples, the, the, the people are coming to him and asking for him to do miracles and solve problems and to teach and to encourage. And, and listen to this verse. And he said unto them, so this is Christ speaking, Come ye, selves, your, ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had not leisure so much as to eat. Now what's interesting is, all the activity was not finished. There were still people coming and going and asking for help and ministry to be done. And, and what Christ says is this, is he says, choose intentionally. Even though your to-do list is not done, choose to step away and to rest in the midst of it. Even though all of our to-do list is not done, we need to choose to intentionally rest in God. Now, I'll say something that maybe you haven't heard a pastor say before, and that's this. It may be that some of you need to do less ministry. Have you ever thought about that? If you are so involved in ministry that, that every service you are out working with kids or in some, some ministry that you are not able to sit as a church family and worship and hear God's word preached, I'm just telling you, you are putting a burden on yourself that God never asked you to carry. It may be that you need to do less ministry. It may be that you need to take some things out of your schedule so that you can intentionally rest the way God calls us to. It may be that some of the, the work and, and, and some of the activities and, and some of the projects that we do, we need to take a step back from so that we can restore the way God has called us to. Resting is restoring. Not only is resting restoring, but second of all, we see that resting is reflecting. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, he says, There is one alone, and there is not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother, yet is there no end of all his labor. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches, neither saith he, For whom do I labor, and bereave my soul of good? This is also vanity. Yea, it is a sore travail. So we see that we are created for rest, number one. It is restoring our bodies, and physically and spiritually, we need God-given rest, but then we also see that resting is reflecting. You see, God uh, gives us this picture here of a very sad individual. He's a man that is alone. It says he has no family, he has no wife, no children, he doesn't even have a brother. It says that this man is consumed with his work. He, he's not consumed with his work so that he can provide for his family because he doesn't have one. He's not consumed with his work so that he can give to others because he's just consumed with hoarding what riches he can amass. And he's so consumed with his daily work that he never steps back to examine why he's doing what he's doing. He's so caught up in the routine and so busy with activity, and he just assumes if I am being active, then I must be accomplishing things that matter. And that's not true. The truth is we can be very active and yet at the same time not be accomplishing what it is that God wants us to do with our lives. I, I heard a story and there are several versions of this, and, and the most popular one goes like this. There's a man by the name of John Henry F uh, Faber. He was a French botanist, and he conducted an experiment on these caterpillars. The caterpillars were called pine processionary caterpillars. And what these guys would do is they, 
they instinctively live their lives playing follow the leader. And wherever one caterpillar goes, it leaves a sense, and all the other caterpillars just follow in line and, and follow that guy, and they make these trails. Well, what he did was he took a pot, and in the middle he put some pine needles, which is what they eat, and then he took a handful of these caterpillars, and he put them carefully along the edge of the outside rim of this pot, this flower pot. And what happened is probably what you would imagine would happen. They started to follow each other. And the thing is, they left a trail perfectly on the top of that circle, so they ended up just marching around the top of this circle time after time after time. They were searching for food. And they were so active searching for food and going in the circle that they went day after day, and after seven days and seven nights, they say that they actually died of starvation being active looking for food. You know, they were very active, but they were accomplishing very little. Can we not do that? Can we not get so, so consumed with our schedules and our to-do list? And, and we, we are very active. But do we ever step back to see, are we accomplishing what God wants us to accomplish? Are we actually doing what God says is important in our life? Solomon, he was very active in his life. He spent his whole life climbing ladders, but they were, they were leaned against the wrong building. And we can be very active, and we can do a lot of things, but, but do we do the things that actually matter? Do we take time to step back and, and reflect on our God, and reflect on our Savior, and to reflect on the people that God has placed in our lives? Do we do the things that actually matter? And Solomon, he says, there is one that is so consumed with work and so busy in their schedule that they never lift their head up to look and see where they are. Never takes time to spend time with the family or enjoy the blessings that God has placed in their life or to spend time with their Savior. And so resting is reflecting. It is a chance to step back and, and worship to God, give a day to Him where we focus on Him and the relationships and the people that He has placed in our lives. And third of all, I want you to see resting is relinquishing. I want you to skip over to chapter 5 and verse 12. And Solomon makes another observation in this verse where he says, The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eat little or much. Get this phrase, but the abundance of, of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. There's a simple truth he declares here, and that's this. The more responsibility we have in life, the harder it can be to sleep at night. The, the more responsibility you have, the higher the stakes are in your life, the more things that can go wrong, and the more things there are to worry about. How many of you have ever had a night where you could not sleep because you were worried about something? I think most of us could say that. And here he's saying, he's saying oftentimes we do not rest because we believe we are the ones that are holding everything in our lives together. And if we were to rest and we are no longer able to hold it all together, then, then everything is going to fall apart. And one of the things about resting is it is an acknowledgement that God is the one who holds everything together and not us. That he is the one that is in control and he is the one that is taking care of things, it's not us. And as long as we believe that we are holding it together, we will not be able to rest. It's interesting, when God asked the Jews to take the Sabbath day, and for one day a week to do nothing, for that, that day they would not sell, they would not work in the field, that was something that was unheard of in that culture, because they were an agricultural culture. And uh, if they did not work, they did not eat. And so no other nations were doing this at that time, and yet God said, I want you to work six days and take the seventh day off and trust that I can do more in six days than you can do in seven days. And really what he was asking them to do was to trust him. And the reason we can rest is because we trust that God is the one that is in control and not us. There's a great verse. I put it on the screen for you so you don't have to turn there, but Psalm 127, verses 1 and 2. It says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Well, what, what does God give to his beloved? You can see it. What's he give to his beloved? God gives sleep to his beloved. So some of you look like you're being beloved right now. <laughs> 
God gives sleep to his beloved. Now, here's the problem with sleep. If we're sleeping, then who's watching the city? If we're sleeping, who's keeping the gate? If we're sleeping, who's taking care of our kids? And the psalmist says it very simply, God is. The reason you can choose to rest and take one day of your week and give it back to the Lord, the reason you can go to bed at night and, and sleep without staying up and worry is because he's watching the city so you don't have to. You, you've probably heard this story. I may have shared it before. But there was a young boy on a, on a cruising vessel going across the Pacific Ocean, and that night the, uh, a big storm kicked up, and the, the boat was rocking, and, and all sorts of things are, are tumbling here and there. And, and the boy woke up and went out of his cabin to, to a little hallway where, where a bunch of men were there and, and worriedly pacing about if they were going to make it through the night. And the, the boy asked the men, he said, what's going on? And the, the men looked at the little boy and said, well, there's a terrible storm, son, and, and uh, we're, we're not sure if we're going to make it through it. And the little boy goes, okay. And without a, a worry on his face, he turns and starts walking back to his cabin, not nervous at all. And the, the men called him back and said, said young man, I, I don't think you understand how serious this is. And, and trying to explain the gravity of the situation. And he said, he said, oh, I'm not worried. He said, my dad's the captain. <laughs> he didn't have to worry about the storm because his dad was already worrying about it for him. That's the picture here. The reason you can rest is because you have a God who's watching the city for you. And you don't have to live your life in worry and fear and anxiety. Really, what God is asking us to do when he asks us to rest is he is actually asking us to trust him. That he is in control and that, that we do not have to control our circumstances because we have a God who is in control of them. And, and I, the, the contrast here is stark. The, he says those that, those that refuse to trust God, they work even while they're resting. Even while they're trying to sleep, they're consumed with worry and their mind is running. Yet on the flip side, someone who truly trusts God, they can rest even while they're working. And it's a totally different mindset. God has called us to rest. You know, God has also given us the ultimate rest. He has given us peace for our souls. It's found through his son, Jesus Christ. Hebrews talks about how, how Christ is the one who was the ultimate fulfillment of the Sabbath. He, he is the one that gives us, our souls, the rest that we are searching for. And like we talked about at the beginning of the message, if you are here today and you do not have rest in your soul, you do not know Christ as your Savior, there is one that offers that. There's one that died on a cross to give us peace with God, to give us rest in our souls. True rest is found from God. We do not serve an oppressive God. Well, we do not serve a God that causes us to, to serve continually and to wear ourselves out, but we have a God who commands us to rest. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. Lord, we thank you that you are such a good God. We, we thank you that you're a God that cares about his creation, that cares for us individually. And Lord, the, the pressure we put on ourselves is not always the same pressure that you have given you have not called us to live an exhausting life in the sense that there is no rest and, and there is a depletion, but you have called us to restorative, regenerative rest. And I thank you for that command. I pray that as we go from here that we'll examine our lives. Are we obeying that? Are we cramming our lives so full that we're doing more than you called us to do? Lord, I thank you for that promise. I thank you for your care for us. I just pray that you would help us to have the wisdom to put what you want us to have in our lives the amount that you want us to have in our lives, when you want us to have it in our lives. And I pray that you would just help us to obey that command as we go from here this week. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Turn to him. Him 549 as we sing together. Like a river glorious is God's perfect peace. Over all victorious in its bright increase, perfect yet in flower, full of greens, perfect yet it groweth deeper.
blessed, pining as he promised, perfect peace and We'll sing that last verse together, every joy or trial. Every joy or trial falleth from above, traced upon our dial by the Son of Love. We may trust in Him holy, find Him holy, true. Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are. 